welcome back to the Independent Investor Channel. We've been provided uh, one of the most critical updates that I've ever seen through the history of uh, chronicling this uh, company's progress and also being a, a shareholder in the company. I want to share my tutorial and, and response to the latest investor presentation that was released. Uh, I will not be talking about the Carno generator because I thought that the presentation was absolutely chucker blocked full of a lot of what we as the investor community have been asking for, um, really doubling down on what uh, anybody who's followed the company knows, uh, and really providing a, a, a wonderful introduction to people who uh, may not know about Hylion and the opportunity and what they're trying to do. Um, I, I think this prolonged uh, downtrend in the stock uh, has um, really kind of taken been taken up by the volatility in the stock market. And I don't really think whatever good news uh, any companies, Hylion uh, alike, uh, will move any stock right now. Sentiment is really, really bad. Uh, it's as if everybody has uh, uh, forgotten that investing can be lucrative. Uh, and it is. Um, if you look at it in the acute, uh, it really doesn't seem like there's any end in sight uh, with what has been, for me, a, a really poor stock market since January of 2021. And um, you can trace it back all the way to the charts on that. Uh, we've had a few uh, spurts and sputters, but uh, you know, for good companies like this that are on the very, very beginning, it doesn't get any better from a value proposition here with 500 million in cash, cash equivalents on the books, uh, looking to take them through their phase one uh, to commercialization, which is scheduled to go into effect in the back half of, la of next year. Uh, this is an absolutely fantastic opportunity. And for those investors that have been patient, um, this uh, company has no place to go but up as they continue along and, and realize what they shared with us on the investor presentation. So uh, I'm going to kick you in. I'm going to provide you my response to uh, and uh, praise of the latest release from Hylion with regard to their current progress, guys. So we'll kick you in and we'll enjoy uh, that response from me. So this is the um, latest release from Hylion and it is their investor presentation. Um, this was the um, most robust document that I've seen in the history of the company. Um, I do not say that lightly. company has gone through a lot of um, uh, phases uh, in its short evolution as a public company. But this investor presentation coupled with the Q&A session as well as uh, Thomas Ely's address I thought was the best piece of information and it was hands down the best piece of information that was released in really solidifying uh, the Hylion story. Um, would be share owners in the company that are as bullish as I am on the company um, understand what the prospects of what this company can bring to bear. Um, but um, it's what we've always been talking about. Uh, attempting to speak from a position of strength, even though the company is very early in its uh, inception. Um, they know they've got the goods. And it wasn't until this last uh, uh, investor presentation where I really believed that they believed it too. And I think Thomas Healy came out and really delivered a, a, a one-two punch on this. I really think he leveled the playing field. And I think it fell on deaf ears. Uh, I think it is a um, real mistake to underscore what it is this company is trying to do uh, and the movement that is happening right now to try to uh, integrate an industry that has been uh, dominated and defined by one method of transportation, uh, the reliance um, in its purest form on diesel for the last hundreds of hundred years. Some CNG applications, absolutely zero hydrogen fuel cell, absolutely zero renewable natural gas, and absolutely even less than zero uh, of a discussion in even bringing into the uh, fold the prospects of introducing um, in any other fuel um, and maybe evolving to more of a fuel agnostic future where fleets are provided optionality. So I'm going to share my reaction to this. This is a very busy 31 slide presentation and you're going to want to stick with me. 
at three dollars a, a share price, it is uh, immaterial at this point. Um, this company's worth twenty five dollars in my assessment, which is my target twenty four dollars. Um, I've never wavered from that. I almost say that, and I almost laugh when this company starts to make its sales. And and right now the critics are saying that they're not making sales, not making sales. It's an escape from thinking because you're suggesting that this company right now is going to fall off a cliff, never to be had an, another sale into its future. And I think that's um, a, a, a real shallow uh, assessment to this company, especially based on their track record and building out their existing order book. I don't know what people are talking about. Um, this company is going to continue to grow upon this uh, order book, and it's not small potatoes, especially this early in the game prior to CARB and NHTSA certification. Um, we're going to talk about a post-certification era here uh, over the coming 15, four, going on 14 months here as we approach this uh, latter part of 2023. We are going to be post-fleet uh, validation here after um, uh, Q1 of 2023, moving into the latter part of 2022. I think it's get a little more gray for me whether or not Hylion can maybe shift the timeline to the left. Uh, but if nothing else, just to hold true on this current timeline that they've uh, put forward for investors for transparency. So I'm going to get into this. I'm going to give you my reaction. Uh, I'm dead set on delivering this with the correct uh, perspective, with neutrality in mind. Uh, I find it interesting all the time how there's so many people out there that seemingly want to see this company fail. Um, I just don't understand it. And I know there's a lot of people out there that see it my way. Um, if Hylion fails to deliver on this solution, the, the, the world will be a worse off place. And that is a fact. And that's putting my stock holding aside and my bullish conviction about this company aside. Um, somebody at some point is going to look at what Hylion is trying to do here with rethinking the way we power the Class 8 space. Um, the traditional means of an internal combustion in engine that drives the drive shaft that mechanically turns the e -ax the drive axle it is something that we've become so accustomed to and it's provided such durability in the industry. I think the industry or people's perception of what Hylion is trying to do is really um, either falling on deaf ears or people are having a hard time accepting that Hylion is looking to turn this industry on its ear. But it's looking to turn it on its ear in a smart way. So I'm not sure uh, I'm so excited about this Earth's most negative company, especially in light of the um, exacerbated downturn in the stock. Um, the stock is 100% uh, out of favor. Um, the stock market is not buying what these guys are putting down. Uh, but this is a displacement slide. And um, Hylion has done this on occasion to try to draw a, a distinction of, of what we have currently and what Hylion sees as a vision for the future with regard to um, just, just how big of a problem we have now, um, how much emissions we're giving off with greenhouse gas emissions, and how the outcry, both publicly and within the industry, I, I'm not really sure what the big barrier is at this point. This is um, what I feel like is the decision and the movement and the direction in which we are, are going. Um, but um, for whatever reason, it's it's progressing at the speed that it's going to progress. Um, but this slide talks about a, um, comparing a fleet of 50 heavy-duty trucks that travel 100,000 miles a year uh, and, and the cost savings over that and, and how much actual greenhouse reduction you would actually get uh, by displacing those 50 trucks with um, hypertruck ERXs. Um, eliminating over 150 million road miles uh, driven by the um, gasoline-powered um, uh, passenger vehicle market. Um, or another way to think about it is um, to grow over 1 million tree seedlings over 10 years. Um, just by thinking about this from a displacement perspective, I mean, these are things that are happening every single day. We know that fleets are significantly larger than just 50, so you just multiply that out by the total number of, of fleets that are out there and, and the numbers start to become staggering um, with the greenhouse gas emissions. And, you know, I, I've always discussed, you know, I, I, there's a lot of people on a lot of different sides of the spectrum here. Um, I would consider myself more of a middle of the road type of applicator here in that I don't want to see business destroyed um, at the expense of saving the planet. 
And I know that's somewhat of an oxymoron because, of course, saving the planet at all cost um, should be where we move. I just think it's the very movement of being at a better place and, and pursuing that end that needs to be called into question. And the uh, ability for us to seek out those solutions and understand from cradle to grave where our energy comes from. And I think it's being missed now. And I think it's being missed in a big way uh, with the passenger car market, especially with Tesla. And I, I, I don't understand it. Um, it's as if we're going to augment the burning of fossil fuels um, with the raping of our lithium, which is uh, finite in nature. These resources cannot just continue to be mined at the pace that um, we expect the industry to grow on the electric side of the house and continue to service that industry with the idea that we're going to introduce all of this new um, electrical demand to the grid uh, over the coming five, ten years. And it seems like that, in essence, is also where a lot of the momentum lies uh, and I just don't see the opportunity. I just don't. I see the opportunity in a company like this, which I have a hard time finding a flaw with. Um, outside of the stock performance, I think, guys, look, I think we'd all agree if the stock was trading at $15, $20 right now, we wouldn't be talking about anything stock related. We would be just be focused on the company. But unfortunately, it just so happens to be a thorn in everybody's side right now, trading at such a recessed valuation and really with no with no metrics to go on right now and understanding whether or not these folks are going to turn out revenues that are more than just immaterial um you know the the market is left to wonder whether or not this company can can get out of its own way and and start to uh right the future and 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 right some of the wrongs of the past trajectory of the stock but um, I found this interesting, um, highly on looks to really allow you to think about the prospects of introducing these new solutions into the marketplace uh, and looking to start on that track, which is going to take a long, long time um, toward displacing uh, the use of fossil fuel and the reduction of greenhouse gases. My interpretation and twist on this slide from, from my perspective as I look on this is I really think Hylion gives um, ample credit, I think, in all fairness, uh, to the plug-in industry. Uh, I, I, for one, do not. Um, I am not bullish on the plug-in market at all. Um, I'm not pursuing any of those opportunities from an investment perspective. I think when people hear electric range extender, I think it, um, it's, it's, there's a negative connotation around it, and here's why. When people think electric range extender, they believe or there's a negative connotation that comes into my mind and I think others as well that it's somehow a bolt-on to an existing problem um, and, and I think people when they look at plug-in electric uh, they replace the plug-in with full electric and it, it seems to be the politically correct direction to go because what this slide does not speak of is where the source of this electricity comes from what this is doing is projecting along a continuum uh, over the next five years, what could be the anticipated market based on what we know now and the range uh, prohibition over the plug-in electric solution now compared to the electric range extender. And you can see here that it, it does not compare at all. I'm not really certain if, if, if and why uh, so many people can't get this. Um, I think Thomas Healy gets it. Um, I think Hylionics uh, gets it. Um, I certainly get it. Uh, I got it from day one, as well as a lot of the other bullish shareholders um, that have taken this ride and journey over this short two years in the company's evolution, which is um, ju just just the beginning. But um, th these are the facts as they stack up. And I'm not really sure I understand how bullish conviction can overshadow the facts insofar as so many companies out there that just dare whisper uh, full electric or plug-in electric um, get the nod in the marketplace and we fail to acknowledge those solutions out there uh, introducing terminology uh, to, to be vetted um, and, uh, along its uh, efficiency. And electric range extender is just that. 
And so Hylian has doubled down in the slide and, and, and really tried to reintroduce this idea that to be um, free of the grid and the demands over the grid and to be independent with the ability to just be subject to fuel availability rather than uh, charging station availability and then the further discussion of actually questioning where that electricity is going to come from uh, that's supplying the grid really allows people to think fourth dimensionally on this deal and it does take some dynamic thinking but once you understand it it really does kind of come full circle in understanding why the this evolution to an electric range extender makes the most sense in the industry um, this slide is chucker blocked full of information here and i, I want to bring your attention to a few things um, one of the bullish convictions that I've had for the last couple of years is the very statement, we don't build trucks, we transform them. And coupled with its asset light business model, the prospects for Hylion, if they can pull this thing off, are scary good because their overhead just is not that robust. Um, their cash position is fantastic. Um, even with the Carnot acquisition and their current burn rate at around $130 million a year, um, this company is poised um, to progress along their business plan as they declared um, from the onset. And what it is going to mean for mass commercialization, it's not in Hylion's best interest to try to forecast um, what that opportunity is going to mean as they push into mass scale up. Uh, I think it's going to be a pleasant surprise for shareholders once we do have more color on that, but it doesn't, doesn't make any um, sense at all to to start speaking along those lines when there are a few critical milestones that Hylion feels like they have to continue to uh, pursue um, to have their holistic uh, proof of concept completed with the Hypertruck ERX. But this asset light uh, idea here um, and the idea that they are well positioned financially here uh, to continue through what I would consider to be phase one of the company. I mean, this is the inception, guys. And as crazy as phase one has been with the developments in the company, developments that we could have never foresaw when this company came public, um, progress in way of increasing the, um, uh, the, the worker, uh, the employee base, um, their uh, current... Uh, tour, which I thought was really enlightening of the uh, Austin, Texas facility. I thought that was a cool insight. I've never been to the facility, uh, but it was, it was kind of one of my first uh, um, introduction to uh, what I've seen in the past. And, and that's just snapshots of, of the inside, but it was a great tour um, by the drone as it flew, flew, uh, flew through the facility. And kind of showed us what what they've got going on on the inside. I thought it was really really cool. But I think highly on when you look at it in in one specific light, you can say, well, the cash burn is going to allow them for three more years of operation, and then in within that time, they're going to have to start to stand on an island. Um, we are at the most anemic phase of the company right now with regard to projecting any type of revenue. I'd have no idea whether or not they're going to turn out ten million. Uh, next year or a hundred million. I have no idea and you might think well that that's a awful wide swath well, we came out of uh, 2021 with zero revenue very anemic few hundred thousand dollars. We're gonna leave 2022 with two to three million Where is the next projected? Uh, pit stop gonna be on the low end is it gonna be five to ten million is it gonna be ten to fifty million? Is it gonna be fifty to a hundred million? Anywhere along that time frame could represent a massive scale up percentage year over year in the company's ability to garner revenue and give that much more um, um, uh, of, a, of a metric to understand that this company toward that critical mass break even and ability to even scale up and, and reach the masses globally once this hyper truck is being introduced into the fleets here. Um, that is going to be the real catalyst where we can um, say with some certainty that there's going to be enough demand over uh, this product from the industry. And I just don't see how that can't happen. Uh, I do not. And I will continue to invest on that front until I'm proven wrong. 
Um, I know there's going to be demand uh, within the industry. <clears throat> I know that fleets should want this based on the payback. And it's really up to Hylion to deliver on, on the specs that they've promised to turn out to fleets. Um, if the specs can't hold up and they can't uh, provide durability to the fleets, then Hylion's not going to have a leg to stand on. So it's really um, in Hylion's court right now um, to make sure that they can deliver upon the promises that they've laid forth uh, going into um, the back half of this 2022 season and into the first part and ending in 2023. This next 15 months is going to be absolutely critical because, like I said, if this company can show any light whatsoever in proving that they can provide some level of um, of, um, of uh, predictability with regard to it, the units that are going to be anticipated to be sold quarter over quarter, uh, and we can get the stock up to $15 to $25, um, the stock price is going to be a non-issue. And then it's just going to be a durability issue with shareholders to ask the question of how long you want to just hold the shares because this company um, I envision holding for the rest of my life. I don't think I'll ever sell it. Um, I, I may take some profits when it hits my first milestone, um, but but aside from that, I don't see myself for the rest of my life not owning Hylion Company. I just don't. I don't see this company and its initiative and its addressable market and what they're trying to do here, um, not growing for many many decades going forward. And I think it's going to probably be a household name because I do think that the transition, the the very paradigm shift that Hylion has presented here. And it is as simple as just swapping out the main ICE engine with the onboard generator and bringing that unit with them that I think is the paradigm shift that right now has not caught fire. But when it does, I think you're going to have other companies that are going to try to copy what Hylion does and bring the solutions because it's just a far better way of remaining independent of the grid. And we have two opposing forces right now where people think that electric is the way of the future. I completely disagree with that. Um, I actually think Hylion has a much better handle on the way of the future than most people give them credit for. So I, I will accept the criticism that Hylion um, doesn't have um, meaningful revenue at this point. What I won't accept is that Hylion doesn't have product uh, and my friends, for those of you who think that Hylion has two products, um, I would go back to the drawing board and I would do more research. Um, with the introduction of the Carnot generator uh, and the research and development that is going into the hydrogen fuel initiative and their ability to segue their existing hybrid product uh, in two separate applications, uh, and the excitement and the buzz around the Hypertruck ERX and what that's going to mean for the consumption of renewable natural gas, my friends, I would contend that Hylion has multiple products. It has a robust portfolio of products, and which ones are going to take hold in the industry is yet to be seen. Um, I do concur with that, but the future potential you can see there with garbage and drayage. Drayage is the movement of containers at the our port facilities and terminals, uh, mass transit with the buses, and then off-highway, which is our mining crews um, that uh, could benefit from this technology and, and help save on fuel cost because that's ultimately what this comes down to. Um, and Hylion, this is the second time in the first seven slides that they've talked about their proprietary solution and software. Um, and I think this is going to be a big differentiator for Hylion uh, in the first mover category, um, as well as being OEM compatible across the line. They don't have to have any type of, um, uh, you know, uh, special consideration for each of these OEMs. They're already ready to go because all they need is the chassis. Um, they need the cab uh, and the preferences that exist therein. And the Hylion solution is agnostic amongst all of these OEMs, which is absolutely fantastic. And I think the sky is the limit to realizing some of this future potential. And if you think that Hylion is not pursuing this with ferocity, um, you would be mistaken. Um, I think these guys understand, and it wasn't uh, as obvious up until this last investor presentation, but I've never seen Thomas Healy so confident in, in the direction that he's taken this and the products that he's bringing to bear here, and uh, never been a better and more exciting time uh, to get in on the ground floor of a company that's looking to revolutionize the world.
So the hybrid system is one that I've always liked. Um, there's some shareholders that don't like it. Uh, they think it's a non-starter. Um, I disagree. Um, it, will, it, will it turn out to be something material? Uh, the verdict is still out. Uh, and if it ends up being uh, immaterial, uh, I would yield uh, on my assessment that I think that this is going to be a huge value proposition for Hylion. Um, I don't think they would have pursued it if they hadn't have done their research and understanding that this is an augment product that augments the CNG on the horsepower side and it augments the diesel market, which fleets now are having hard, hard enough time getting new trucks in. Uh, so the opportunity to, to augment and provide some fuel savings on the diesel side of the house has to be attractive. It has to be. If you can drive the truck a certain number of years, the payback is there and, and the cost will be negligible after so many years. So it, it, it inevitably, when, when you incur the, the small cost of downtime or whatever it takes to send this hybrid unit um, to the OEMs off of the line and get these products into the rigor on the, on the start to start that payback earlier, uh, is in fleet's best interest. And I think this is a slam dunk. I, I'm much more bullish than Thomas Healy even on his own product, which um, it seems like he's done a little bit of cannibalization, um, mentioning on multiple occasions the competition that could be um, introduced by the Cummins 15-liter engine, the CNG engine that has just enjoyed a 500 order, I might add, um, which uh, is a small drop in the bucket when we think about where those applications are going to be put into play. Uh, I think the hybrid solution is the solution for hilly terrain. And the Hypertruck ERX is not, my friends. And there's two types of terrain and everything in between. There's flat and there's hilly. Um, what application and routes do you run? What fuel availability uh, are along that route, both CNG and diesel? Uh, and when you start to, to, to hone in on those routes, it becomes very, very clear as to why Hylion introduced the hybrid Hylion hybrid product um, to augment those routes uh, in uh, in difficult terrain. Uh, I think it's smart. Uh, I think they know this, and I think this is going to be a sleeper product that really helps to supplement the bottom line. Um, look, if they can do twenty-five, fifty million dollars of sales out of this product right here, year over year. Um, that can really help take a bite out of that uh, critical mass that they have to meet to make sure that they can uh, achieve sustainability within the company. Uh, and I think this is an important piece to the puzzle. I think it's an introduction to electrification. Uh, I think fleets are going to find a use case for it. Um, this is not my opinion. Uh, this is actually going on right now uh, with the fleets uh, that have deployed this solution and have... Um, uh, been enjoying that. I'd like to hear more feedback about, you know, the actual cost savings that's being enjoyed. Uh, but we will uh, have more light on that as the company evolves and as these um, uh, uh, fleets have the opportunity to introduce these solutions from year over year into their fleet operations on specific routes. It's just an overview on the specs of the Hypertruck ERX. Um, those of us that are intimately familiar with the company uh, understand this again uh, a notation here for uh, would-be investors to understand with regard to the hypertruck future potential there to the right of the screen uh, but just uh, anticipated total cost of ownership over the life of the truck uh, aimed at uh, providing uh, less uh, of a cost be uh, benefit uh, less cost that goes into operating that vehicle when compared to its diesel counterpart um, they are still boasting 1,000 plus uh, total miles with 75 of total all-electric uh, range. Thomas Healy added some color on this and spoke about um, the uh, entry into New York City, which is where I'm from here. I'm domiciled here in New York City uh, with regard to the noise pollution as well as the, uh, the emissions standards that uh, New York has tightened down on. Um, the Hypertruck ERX will be able to provide that opportunity for those trucks to deliver in New York at all hours. Uh, of the day and not restrict them on their ability to make those deliveries uh, if they can operate uh, with up to 75 uh, miles of all electric capacity. 670 horsepower, pretty pretty incredible. Um, that That's incredible. I think the specs kind of speak for themselves. And, and then the uh, existing infrastructure here and at launch looking to um, introduce uh, the Hypertruck in a mass scale to those routes that uh, uh, traverse this country. Uh, and take uh, advantage of those existing uh, 700 CNG 
uh, locations uh, to move uh, freight from point A to point B. Um, so the Hylion story is getting awful interesting. And, and so for you guys that have been bullish shareholders for this entire time, perhaps maybe there's a little bit of frustration uh, for me. Um, not so much. The only frustration I have is that the stock market doesn't have this stock right. Um, we do. And um, that's my only frustration. Uh, my frustration isn't with how complex this Hylion story is, is getting uh, and their roadmap toward um, you know a hydrogen future. I'm not sure how applicable this is. I think this is probably going to morph in what is available, but I think it just speaks to the dynamic nature of how Hylion is looking to roll out multiple solutions and make sure that they are future-proof uh, in their application and making sure that um, they can provide a number of different solutions based on the fleet need, um, and that's really the key. What do the fleet need, um, and who is the company that can fill that fleet need? Um, Hylion is, is the only one at this point that can boast that they are along a trajectory to deliver on a product to meet those uh, fleet needs as we go forward. This is kind of an in-your-face slide. Uh, I kind of got an impression here from Thomas Healy that he's kind of fed up uh, playing defense all the time and good for him. I'd like to see him play offense. Uh, I'd like to see him play offense a lot more and just put this right in, right in everybody's face with regard to why this company, for whatever reason, I, I don't know if it's corruption, uh, but um, you know, for me, the frustration comes from losing faith in a stock market that you, you, you make a good investment in a company and then you have to wait for the corruption to die down, the short selling to die down, um, the whatever lobbying is happening at the government to suppress an idea like this uh, and stymie technology into where so many people have just thrown in the towel given up and 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 just uh really just thrown this opportunity out uh, only to see it go up into the future it happens over and over again in the stock market um, that's the imperfect nature of the market but these are the three factors here that fleets use to make their decisions we've talked about this we've talked about this at length uh, and this just reaffirmed and, and really kind of codified what we've discussed over the last couple of years with this uh company the upfront cost and operating cost. Uh, is their infrastructure enough and the ability to refuel? My friends, if they cannot refuel, how are they supposed to, okay, roll a truck down the road? All right. Not all roads are downhill. All right. Nicola would be fine if they could inevitably just go downhill all the time, 100% of the time, but they don't. Okay. Even going over flat ground does take power and it does take fueling stations and infrastructure to provide that. And it just doesn't exist right now. That's the key. Um, there are other people out there that would disagree with me and say, yeah, it does exist. It exists in your mind, um, not in reality. When it comes right down to a cost-based decision that fleets are faced with making, they cannot commit to a product that they cannot be um, rest assured that there are fueling stations along those routes. And these few that are being introduced right now I believe aren't so much being introduced because they believe that they're the best product. I believe that they're being introduced to the fleets because of the availability along these unique routes, number one. And number two, fleets want to get a hold of the technology and study firsthand and start to gather knowledge for their own bottom lines as to whether or not these are going to be viable into the future. As far as return orders, there is no promise at all whatsoever that these Nikola trucks that have been sold on the onset are going are going to impress the fleets out there enough to garner return orders. And then the third tier of this leg in the decision-making metrics is the environmental aspect uh, and the government restrictions on those companies to uh, really force the hand. I hate to use that uh, language because if these solutions cannot provide comparable logistics uh, service on over-the-road transport, um, then it's going to be a hit to the bottom line. And I don't want to see that happen. I want to see these businesses survive and thrive. Um, and I think highly on it can actually help them get there, meet this three-tier benefit. We in the investor community have been talking about this for a long, long time. And here it is right in your face, the ability to identify a very popular route um, going from east to west or west to east here from Dallas, Texas to the port of LA. Um, I presume that this is, it looks like I-10. Yeah, it does. It kicks through El Paso. 
um, and then up through Dallas. It might be above I-10, I goes through Houston. So I don't know what actual freeway this is. It might be a combination of highway and freeway to get to Los Angeles. Uh, but nonetheless, this is what we've talked about, uh, a cross comparison between hydrogen and the BEV solutions here. Hylion just blows it out of the water. Um, those dots along the route are actual um, fueling infrastructures with natural gas, uh, and it speaks to itself. Um, if you're a fleet owner and you're looking to move goods from Dallas to Los Angeles or vice versa, this is what you're going to be looking at. This is the truth of the matter. And until the market wakes up to this fact, and when they do, it's going to be a shift in momentum. Um, I'm going to start accumulating shares here again at the $3 mark. Um, because I just think that this opportunity is being drastically overlooked and it's going to create millionaires. Um, it's going to create a lot of millionaires out there for people who understand it uh, and really truly buy into the idea of investing and in what this company is looking at in the data. Um, and they're looking at all the right stuff. Um, you want to go with hydrogen? That's what you're investing in right there. Uh, high fuel cost, um, no current infrastructure, it's there. Um, cumulative fuel time is 45 minutes of downtime. Um, impossible to sell to, to industry to do that. And, and this is what other, other people who are pushing other solutions out there are way ahead of their time. I'm not suggesting that hydrogen is not going to be a player. Um, I'm more of a bear on hydrogen than I am on current solutions right now. And I'm not saying that it's not going to evolve into something material. But if they have no infrastructure now, this grid right here and the unavailability of those fuels only allow it to work in the vicinity of the port of Los Angeles, which is why some of the Nikola trucks now are working in the port and not even touching or trying to engage on this long haul solution. Hyliana said many, many times vocally that they are in the long haul business. And I have been very hard pressed to hear Nikola uh, volunteer themselves uh, into that business. Uh, and rightly so. They know this just as well as anybody, uh, and they will fail in comparison to what Hylion brings to the to the forefront here with a solution uh, that act, can actually succeed along this route and can actually do it at a lower fuel cost uh, to the owner of the unit. And a cross comparison here of the fuel, um, it blows it out of the water. Why do you think the RNG and the CNG Hypertruck ERX is so important? Um, it's It's important. And it's going to it's going to um, continue to be relevant into the future. Uh, renewable natural gas is going to grow as a as a fuel. Um, it's going to uh, provide one of those options amongst I feel like will be many in the industry uh, across these different uh, predominant fuel sources now. Um, in the discussion, gallon being, uh, excuse me, diesel uh, at 549 being the dominant fuel source now. Uh, and then the addition, the following three there with hydrogen and electric and uh, renewable natural gas being kind of in the discussion now and in the early stages of development. But ask yourself, um, where do you want to put your allegiance? You want to put your allegiance in um, the more expensive fuels and less available, or do you want to go with the cheaper fuel? Um, and the more available. It's just that simple. For me, the decision is very, very simple, and you understand where my loyalty lies and has lied over the last couple of years and will continue to lie in the future as we share uh, this story to our grander audience here on the channel. So each of these slides are so chucker block full of information, guys. I would invite you to kick over to highlyon.com and spend uh, a few hours in research. You have to read every bullet point. And you really have to understand what Hylion is looking to communicate here. And this is just uh, fantastic. This is just when information is overloaded to investors, you will hear neither whim nor will from me um, with regard to um, Hylion's lack of transparency and information. This is exactly what uh, investors deserve. And this is what they should have been provided from the onset. I do. There's no reason why this information couldn't have been provided earlier. But here we have it. Uh, the majority of natural gas sold at fueling stations in 2021 was renewable natural gas. Then you kick over to the left there and you see there why renewable natural gas is such a dominant fuel source in this discussion. It's because of its uh, net negative uh, carbon emissions profile and scoring. That way you can actually take that um, 
uh, that RNG and look to drive down your total overall score within your businesses. I think this is going to be more of the discussion, um, and I think it is going to absolutely be an incredible, incredible development phase over the next five to ten years as renewable natural gas uh, continues to grow and continues to be utilized for its undeniable scientific uh, turn back with regard to its um, its emission score that it provides back to the fleets uh, that choose it as a primary fuel of choice in their operations. Uh, just another in your freaking face slide from Hylion, just a freaking kick in the freaking teeth of people. Um, this says it all. Um, I, I, don't, I don't need to reemphasize. We talk about this week in and week out. Um, this is an awesome slide right here. Um, this is a, this is what we consider in the investing arena a slam dunk. Um, I can't believe that Warren Buffett hasn't taken a stake in this company. Um, he looks at the same stuff I look at, and I cannot believe that Warren Buffett has not taken a stake in highly on mark my words now. Um, I think Warren Buffett knows everything about this company right here, and he's just waiting patiently uh, to see this value proposition play out. If he waits too long, he's not going to get the uh, the entry that we as patient shareholders have received sub 10 here for a prolonged amount of time. But this just talks about the, um, the viable solution for the future based on the existing infrastructure. It's just that simple. And uh, the existing public infrastructure, you see there, there it's for the class six and eight space. So that's kind of one of the first times I've ever seen the class six space uh, mentioned in a highly on document. They've been so hard over on sharing their, um, insistence on penetrating the class eight market but uh, this slide just speaks to fuel availability and um, this is really the key uh, and it will continue to be a major major driver going forward to highly on as we unfold this story um, this was probably the most confusing slide for me uh, i'm not necessarily that excited about this um, i was kind of irritated actually when i saw this um, if they can make this work, I'm okay with it. But I, I think they're trying to provide clarity where they're not, they're ill prepared to provide this level of color uh, on actually taking receipt of trucks and, and doing some of the installs. Um, that's not a start of production. That's a limp along. That's not mass scale. Uh, it's a path to market, but it's not mass scale um, that they promised. And, and this is one that I'm uh, trying to build up a little bit of immunity to and, and set myself up for some major, major disappointment um, because I don't, I don't think 2023 is going to be the mass scale up that I talk about. Now, th those are not my words, that's theirs. Um, when we talk about mass scale production and volume production and, and this and that, um, Thomas Healy has not shied away from latter part of 2023 and probably realizing deliveries into 2024. I, I think that's a pipe dream. I don't think they're going to do it. Um, I hope they supply us. They surprise me. Um, but I think we're, we're, we're much further than that out. And I think it's because of this. Um, I think without the assistance of the OEMs, I think we falter in meeting, um, an obligation to provide fleets with orders in excess of four figures as opposed to three figures, um, I, I think, uh, or even two. Um, I, I don't think that um, the plant in Austin has the ability to take trucks and, and turn those back out to back to the OEM uh, for final uh, certifications and then delivered for, to the customer. We can't do that um, in the amount of hundreds or even thousands. We're talking about 10, 20, uh, 50, probably maximum. Uh, and we're not talking any more than probably 100 to 250 per quarter. Um, and that is cranking. Um, and that, my friends, is not the production that I got involved with. Um, whether or not the future potential, and when they say future, uh, that kind of irritated me um, because they've contended all the way along the line that this was going to be a massive part of their operation. Um, and I've questioned this all along in how... Uh, capable they're going to be in providing mass scale to customers uh, as opposed to try to use the Austin office uh, to try to supplement and and you know 250 a thousand orders a year is just not going to make muster uh, it's not going to keep the lights on it's not going to pay salaries it's not going to 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 um, to supplement their 130 burn rate and um, the company's going to suffer for it 
Uh, so this pass right here, as much as it is an asset light business model, I completely disagree that they continue to rely on that asset light business model and continue to turn out zero revenue. I mean, really, anything less than five million is is anemic and it just it keeps the electricity bill paid. But aside from that, um, it's not the way that a large company needs to operate um, and they need to do better on this uh, as we move forward into this potential for uh, ramp up in in uh, in production numbers and is the product good enough for these companies to take delivery of said uh, product and be so excited to um, continue to be repeat orders with Hylion I believe the answer is yes I do and it's that very pressure that I think can assist with what I was uh, so bearish on in the last slide uh, in putting that pressure on their own specific OEMs if they prefer even a new OEM, International, Volvo, um, and, and, and many of the other OEMs alike, <clears throat> to put that pressure on them to make available uh, to them the Hylion solution. I think it's going to help kind of connect the dots in some of that collaboration and collaborative efforts between the customers and the OEMs themselves, but uh, pretty good who's who uh, of customers that Hylion has. Um, do they sell product? Yes. Um, do they have customers? Yes. Um, is that customer base ever growing? Yes. Um, and I think this the, the, the continual uh, uh, trajectory of growth in sales is not to be denied. And, and I think people who fail to understand that about the uh, orders backed by deposits and the current reservation book are failing to see the opportunity going forward. I really think so. And I think it's early enough to give Hylion a, an immense amount of credit for garnering these orders so early on, even before validation, even before certification, because these companies are taking a chance. What if it doesn't meet NHTSA certification and these guys have deposits on orders that on a truck that they presumed would meet certification? Now, this is no way to imply that it's not going to meet certification, rather just an acknowledgement of how bullish these customers are on the Hylion product and enough faith in Hylion to actually place these so early on in the cycle. So we'll look to expand upon this fleet and uh, expand upon that client base that they have. Uh, but so far, a very, very impressive list of who's who in the Class 8 trucking space. And it'll be great to see these numbers build out over the next couple of years. If you go back to some of my earlier videos, I talk about some of the catalysts that could uh, rollout and the federal and state mandates were part of that. This was before any of this discussion about ACT and ACF under the CARBS initiative to ensure that uh, fleets and operators uh, both exclusively have their own charge uh, to ensure uh, the start of introduction of alternative solutions uh, aimed at uh, lowering greenhouse emissions within their operations and trying to do their part, small part, um, in, in meeting those uh, opportunities. Uh, Thomas Healy spoke about the exciting news that the Hypertruck ERX will qualify for that. Really just solidifies this photo that was taken right outside the New York Stock Exchange, a place that I've visited and I do visit frequently down on Wall Street. It's uh, pretty amazing there. To see highly on there, this thing is not for naught. Um, this thing is a real, uh, a, a real initiative. This company is doing amazing things here, and they will, in fact, qualify for all of these uh, initiatives um, when they are rolled out. So pretty incredible. Seventy-five percent of the ZEV credit, a uh, hundred percent of the ZEV credit from the ACF, the fleet mandate, um, and then that's the forty thousand dollars of tax incentive there. Um, they didn't mention the dollar of uh, uh, renewable natural gas credit that's being proposed and looking to come uh, into law the end of this year as well, which is just another uh, feather in the cap. And it shows how serious the government is about uh, helping to encourage this initiative and stepping in the right direction for the planet uh, and rewarding those fleets that take this initiative on and this leap of faith with, with these companies that, let's be real, are unproven. Uh, highly on Nikola, even Tesla, for crying out loud. These are unproven technologies. Um, I, I, I just saw a Twitter feed that came through where somebody in cold weather could not open their Tesla because the door was shut. 
Um, these are some of the things that um, customers are going to have to get used to. And when the hype dies down, it's really going to be the performance of these products that carry them through. Um, and I think these uh, supplements to the bottom line really help these uh, companies make these informed decisions about taking the leap of faith with these companies and introducing them into their fleet operations. Uh, just a quick word about this. I wouldn't cover this slide uh, because all of the board of directors has uh, remained the same here uh, and they've been the same for a while here. Um, but the, the big change here is on the executive team here with the addition of John Panzer. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I really liked Sherry Baker. What a, what a great um, uh, stint of service that she provided over the last couple of years. I really liked her straightforward approach. Um, but um, uh, there has been a decision to be made, and I'm quite certain that we will not be provided any color as to the details surrounding that. Um, that replacement um, uh, with John, uh, but John comes with a wealth of knowledge as well, uh, and I would uh, safely presume that perhaps maybe the shift in direction was for uh, for the betterment of the company, and I, I hope that to be the case as a uh, as a robust shareholder in the company. Um, so we'll see. We'll get to see John's first address here um, on this next call. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see uh, to see how he breaks down and, and presents his remarks uh, at those quarterly calls. I want to bring your focus down to the bottom of this slide, start of production. Um, that is going to be a huge, huge milestone and really a start into what I'm going to consider to be phase two uh, of the company here. Um, this whole inception has been quite a long and winding road. Uh, this proof of concept and taking this company from what uh, evolved from seven years ago to what they have now is just light is just night and day. Um, the progress is immeasurable. Um, the 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 spectrum that they have followed here over the evolution of this company is just incredible. It's going to be great to check these further boxes here for winter validation and and uh, get this product into the um, uh, fleet trials. Uh, and, and get that feedback started through the Hypertruck Innovation Council. I think that's going to be just fantastic. Um, this company is starting to march along a, a number of different fronts here uh, in seeking out their CARB and EPA NHTSA certification uh, as we eventually start to finalize this proof of concept phase and, and, and achieving these additional milestones uh, going into the back half of 23 and the, and the eventual start of production of this hyper truck. It's going to be an exciting time. And uh, I, as a would-be small shareholder in the company, I am going to be along for the ride. Uh, and it's going to be exciting to see these milestones come to fruition into the future. One thing I'd like to suggest is something that I really appreciate here, and this is the account of the um, right after the Carno generator deal, uh, that of which I've left out of this presentation because I've done specific Carno generator uh, videos through the channel, and I want to wanted to keep this specific to what I felt like was a real response to investors. Uh, and and you guys know that I have generated a lot of churn on Hylion, both on the positive side, and I've been very very critical of the company. Um, and um, I, I do not, I reserve the right to deploy either uh, where I see fit. And um, this is pretty impressive here to go ahead and release this information with where the company is right now, uh, with its current R&D spending, uh, with its um, continued march toward uh, following along on their fully funded business plan to commercialization. And this is a snapshot of exactly uh, where we uh, where we thought they would be reducing the expenses in between 130 and 140 uh, for the, um, the 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 year of 2022. This slide is kind of a punchy in the face, smack you, kick you in the teeth type of slide. Really looks to bring your attention to the highly on advantage. Uh, we talk about this in a lot of different capacities, but make no mistake, make no mistake, my friends, every penny that's wrapped up in this company right now is going toward a very incredible initiative. And these are the highlights right here. Robust capital position, we just talked about it, 500 million in cash and cash equivalents uh, in the bank to help supplement along their line toward commercialization. Um, it is an asset light business model. I talked about my heartache with that. Um, they need to stop resting on those laurels because at $130 million burn rate, um, not making any revenues is gonna is gonna uh, be really quick. Uh, it's gonna it's gonna go quick, and the this company needs to prove that they can stand on their own. 
uh, with regard to what they consider to be a very, very strong market demand over the product. Um, I'm not sure. I'm a little neutral on that. I, I acknowledge the orders that are on the book, uh, but I don't see the strong market demand thus far. I, I don't see people knocking down Hylion's door. Unless this is going on without our knowledge, uh, I don't see this. Um, I don't I don't think token orders of 10 orders that float in um, speaks to any type of overwhelming demand on the company. Uh, if this company started to get two, three orders uh, every other day from multiple fleets, yeah, then I would consider that to be strong market demand. And who am I to say that those orders aren't coming in? Uh, and I would safely go out on a limb and offer my opinion to suggest that they are. But the product itself sells itself. Low operating cost, uh, the net uh, carbon ne negative and neutral solutions now, depending on the fuel that's ran and then to leverage the existing infrastructure, it's just an absolute slam dunk. So it was great for me to be able to share my uh, response to this uh, investor presentation. Uh, it was the most robust document. And I don't forget these things. I put these away in my foundation that I'm building in this company as a share owner. Um, it actually made me more bullish to go and actually buy more shares of the company here, having had been provided this very robust 31-page investor presentation that was put together by the Hylion team. Uh, so kudos from me direct. I thought this was a slam dunk, very well-timed. Uh, with the market headwinds, nothing's going up right now. So it really doesn't matter what this company does uh, in way of um, expecting any type of, of movement in the stock price. Uh, no company's moving right now. So nothing to feel bad about. Um, I think it's allowing them ample time. I think that uh, if the company was suffering in good markets, uh, it would be kind of unfortunate. But right now, suffering in a down market basing and what I consider to be a fairly bottom out price um, at, at, at cash value. I mean, the company's valued right now at about $600 million. Um, they, They've got $500 million in the bank, guys. So everything we've just talked about with regard to their real product, their opportunity, their addressable market, they're be, being provided $100 million worth of value to that. Um, it doesn't get any more anemic with that when we're talking about fundamental investment. Acknowledging that the only delta with this company is that they don't have... Um, material revenue at this point. I expect that to change over the next 15 months and give us some sort of idea uh, that they're going to step into some sort of scalable uh, and reliable uh, mass scale and production going forward, going into 2024 uh, and later in the company's evolution of once we get completed with this phase uh, and enter into more of a production phase in the company, I think it's going to be great to kind of sit back, maybe get the stock price up to 25, 30 bucks uh, where it belongs. It's just that simple and it will eventually get there. It's not there now. now. That's just the way it is. But we'll continue to beat the drum on this opportunity for Whippy share owners uh, and anybody that's interested in, in the vision that this company has uh, for a cleaner and more sustainable future for our planet. Guys, thanks so much. We'll kick you back and we'll conclude the video. All right, guys. So we've come out of the uh, investor presentation that was released by Hylion. I don't expect a lot of movement here as we close out 2022 over the next couple of months. Um, I really do expect a huge ramp up in some of the catalysts that we discussed along their timeline going into early 2023 in preparation for um, their ability to turn out uh, units on a mass scale. Um, you're going to hear my response to each of the value propositions that were outlined in the presentation. Um, I really thought it was one of the best pieces of literature that was uh, released by Hylion, bar none, and by a long shot. Um, there's been some surprising catalysts, but those catalysts have not really been captured uh, very well because Hylion's busy doing what they need to do right now to ensure that their proof of concept winter validation fleet testing, which is the next on the docket here uh, to unfold, are, are, are coming, uh, coming along, and they are. Uh, it's exciting times at Hylion. It's going to be an incredible time once we can get this stock uh, price out of the basement, which has just been uh, an absolute rough ride for shareholders. Anybody who's gone through uh, this downturn uh, with me uh, are ironclad and forever forged in the highly in air community uh, for knowing what they saw, sticking with their conviction, understanding what they were investing in through thick, thin, thick, thick and thin, 
um, this company has done nothing but show us that it is progressing toward an end. All we have to do is get that mind shift in the industry uh, and, and understanding that uh, Hylion is here to stay and provide solutions for many, many years uh, to come down the line, guys. So if you enjoy the information, man, I'd invite you to subscribe to the channel. Leave your comments at the bottom of the video if this struck up your interest. Share the video with anybody out there that you know may be interested in the highly on opportunity, man. Bring them on the channel. I'm, I'm one of very few um, that actually offer my commentary. Um, I usually offer my response to good information that is being released uh, uh, by Hylion. Uh, that's the unique angle of my channel. And I appreciate you guys tuning in for the totality of the message, guys. Thank you so much and good luck in your investment future.